which results in the, uh, the playback of a C down there. Now, this recording is again being recorded by just another dictaphone, which makes recording of the first dictaphone even worse. And uh, that gets played back later, and what we hear is this octave two octaves down. So now we are three octaves down, and what the composer does in his composition is that we will hear the playback of the first dictaphone and then the playback of the second dictaphone, just write another, and the pianist is supposed to react on those and play the first one, play the first C again. Oops, that's Those are recordings. Now, dictaphones are not perfect. This is why they are autopobora. They don't really record an octave, but a major seventh. <laughs> so this is why you just didn't hear octaves. But uh, these, these uh, strange things. Now, and because um, what I told you about the Ebo and the, uh, and the CD record and all the hammering, all that got recorded on the, on the, on the dictaphones too. So in the end we have all these layering layerings stacked. And although I'm only playing in the first five minutes of the piece in the utmost octave of, of the piano in the end of the piece with all these transformations and recording and re-recording, playing it lower, uh, you have a sound spectrum that goes on uh, almost the, the whole piano. Okay, the next example was just an example, I will not elaborate on that, on, uh, on, on <laughs> piano playing. So that is of course part of my work too, just playing uh, very fast uh, piano playing. The next piece is actually, um, this is by Michael Meyerhof, and this is actually what you see up there. This is a picture from my practicing room, these are the master's hands, the composer's hands, uh, showing me how to play the piece you're hearing now. Okay, so here the, you hear the sound and you hear this vibrator in the beginning, which then uh, uh, goes, uh, um, uh, uh, which then uh, s uh, stops. And actually, this is this big glass ball. The glass ball is uh, being, um, it starts to resonate because of the ebo, which you see here, which I showed you just before. The ebo makes the string resonate. The resonation of the string then transfers itself to the bridge. And there's this glass ball on the bridge which starts to, uh, to move. And, and uh, this is the vibrator that you hear. It's, it's the ball that's banging against the nails on the bridge. And then the res resonation again goes back to the string. And the physical uh, term for that would be multiple resonating systems. You can imagine that when you uh, throw a stone in the water and you throw another stone in the water, that the waves of these two stones intermingle with each other. This is what happens here. The string gets, uh, uh, resonates and makes the ball resonate and the ball fr from the pitch then makes, because the, the pedal is pressed, makes uh, all kinds of other uh, uh, vibrations in, in the piano too. And what we get here is a sound which uh, sounds like it is electronically made, but it is uh, a purely, uh, well, if, apart from a 9 volt block battery, it is uh, purely from emanating from the piano. And all the time that I, that I, and all the time when I hit the string, the, the, the ball starts to move a little bit more and then it starts to lose energy. But you hear in the beginning, uh, let's go back a little bit. These 
very dark. Boom. There's a tennis ball. He's got in his left hand and he just let the tennis ball fall on the string and when it and when it jumps up again you hold it in your hand again. And along with the, with, with the balls um, gives gives these sounds. Um, okay. Uh, the last piece is for piano and tape, and I will talk about this just in a minute, because uh, now we are going to the second half, uh, which is about uh, extending the piano not from things within. I would think that putting a glass ball on the bridge or working with the ebo or working with my fingers inside, this is all change, changing the piano sound from within the piano. Now we go to the section uh, with external means, which in the easiest way would mean that we have a tape, a pre-recorded tape by a an, by an composer to play with the piece. Now, the problem here is, how do you play with the piece? Um, how do you know where the piece is and how does the pianist on stage know where he's supposed to play? Now, if you have um, music in 4-4, which is straightforward, that should not be a problem. So that would be just play along music like this one. This very fine piece was made by a computer program, it's called Band in the Box. Um, all you do is uh, you say, I want, I want these harmonies, I want these scales, I want, um, I want this style, and the computer program does the piece by itself. It's really hard to, sell, to tell. Now, who's, who's the composer? Is the composer the one who told the machine, please write me a rumba or a samba or, or whatever? Or is it the machine itself? The machine even delivers the title of the piece. So the title of this piece is uh, The Mention of You. And the composer, or the one who told the music to do the piece, is Johannes Goebel, actually. It's the director of the AMPAC in uh, Troy, New York. It's, uh, that's a big uh, institution. OK, so that would be play along. But if you listen closely to the music I was playing to you, that my music does not sound like this. And uh, it's a little bit harder to play along with the tape. Uh, let's sell them a 4-4. Four, four. Um, so there are certain other means that you can use. And um, if it doesn't, it has to be really right on top of each other. Uh, say you have a tape, and uh, you know the tape is about 30 minutes long, and I want the pianist to play along with it, and I want them to, to be together at certain instances in, in time, but not all the time, because they are not playing in total synchronicity, but just together, um, then it, uh, you can use a stopwatch. A stopwatch is not uh, very uh, perfect, uh, because you always react a little bit too late to the stopwatch. And um, so it would not be uh, useful to make something that's really intertwined. Um, but it is actually used uh, in the piece by Luigi Nono, you will hear tonight, at Serende uh, Offerte Serene. And it is used in this one uh, piece here too, that's got a video to it. Actually, it is a piece from the 60s by Terry Riley, it's called uh, uh, Keyboard Study Number no. 1. Um, and uh, I played this in a planetarium in Hamburg four years ago, and an artist from Berlin made a video to it. Now, we agreed beforehand, do you still hear me? We agreed beforehand uh, how long the piece would be, so I had to, so I had to be in, in time with the ending of the piece. And uh, now you don't hear the stopwatch, but we'll just listen to, to the music and to the video. This is just an example. The video and the music are not really interlatched but we can play side by side, and we stop after 17 minutes, um, but we are only listening to two minutes now. Um, we stop after 17 minutes because I've got a top stopwatch that tells me so. <laughs>
Uh, uh, the video has a very bad quality. Um, it was uh, made for, for this planetarium, which has got seven beamers. And you must imagine that you lie on your back and you see this video just dropping from the dome of the thing um, uh, together with this mesmerizing music. Um, but uh, I didn't want to load all the data into my, into my computer. It's lots of DVDs. Uh, so this is just a, uh, a very uh, a version with a bad quality. So, but this is just uh, now the example for playing with a stopwatch. Another thing uh, would be uh, like we did on a piece like this. And I will just play the, the music for uh, two minutes and then uh, talk a little bit more about it. Now we should hear something. But we do not. Does anybody have an idea why we don't hear anything anymore? Well, the volume is totally up here. Oh, it was. Okay, thank you.
Okay, this is a piece you're going to hear tonight. It's by Johannes Kreitler. It's called Klavierstück 5, uh, piano piece 5. And the piano part and the tape part are very closely interwoven, and I will uh, show you this in uh, three examples. And then you will hear it later very easily. Let's go back here. <laughs> Okay, you hear the electronics go up, slower, 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 and then the piano starts right where the last uh, thing of the of the electronics will be. Let's hear it again. Right. So uh, next example. playing five times this thing here. And this is pre-recorded. You can hear it from the other speaker. So when, when, when the piano starts to playing this phrase, then immediately the tape takes over and plays a pre-recorded uh, uh, similar but not the same phrase. Live playing. And this is the answer of the tape. And the last uh, example is probably the most striking. The piano plays from the bottom, from, from, uh, from, uh, from the low keys, and goes up, 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 and then it plays the highest key, I think. I think it's in B, uh, on, on the piano, and when the piano plays the B, then the el electronic uh, steps in, and it sounds like as if the uh, as if the sound would break. It's like it's breaking, like it's like ice is breaking. Okay, now I play very low, Five. higher, higher, and then it sounds like I'm like like. And it sounds like the, um, the string breaks. Let's hear it once more. And there it goes. So here, the, the live part and the, and the tape part must really be together. If I'm playing that too early or a little bit later, then we wouldn't have the effect of the, of the ice breaking. So, um, and if you listen to this a little bit, it would be really hard to find a rhythm in this, in this part. So what I have in my left ear playing the piece sounds like this. Null, eins, zwei, drei. Vier, fünf, sechs, sieben, acht, neun, zehn. Again, we have a lot of uh, composers featured here tonight. This is the composer's voice counting me through the piece. So he, he just counted zero, one, two, three, four, five, and he counts the seconds. The piece is, is notated in seconds. He just counts me through so that I'm really, after three minutes and ten seconds, right on this B sharp. And, uh, and the tape would sit in. So this is an example for playing with a click track, uh, which is uh, always useful when there are long pauses in the piece, because I might not count very well through a 30 second pause and start a little bit earlier or later when I might not be supposed. So this is uh, an example where you need a click track, or when uh, what's on the tape is not is not countable, so you can't make it 4-4 four, four out of it, or, or, or uh, something like this. So, um, so that is uh, an example for the, for the click track. Um, another thing is, now, what we had uh, so far is tapes that run through. Somebody presses the start button at the beginning, and the tape runs through, and when the piece is over, then the piece stops. And I stop too, and I bow. Um, 
Uh, another thing would be to that leaves me more freedom is when the piece is chopped up in five or six different sections. And like when I had a cadenza in, in the middle and then, and then I can play freely alone and then the pace and then the tape should set in, then I can trigger the next part of the tape uh, with a pedal or I could do it uh, with a MIDI, uh, MIDI keyboard that's on top of the piano, then I could uh, say, now I press the D, and then the tape would start playing uh, what it's supposed uh, to do. Um, an example for this. Uh, um, is this one piece here. This is a just a short little segment out of a tape uh, by Maximilian Markel. He's a young uh, composer from Berlin. And what you just heard were the birds in his backyard, which he uh, recorded and then transformed with Max MSP. But you can still hear, maybe it's, it sounds a little bit like birds. And I can actually play with it. Uh, and there are, um, because you hear distinct uh, tone qualities and you hear distinct pitches, which I can play with. And now if you s look up, uh, you will see uh, that uh, this, this real player counts the seconds. And actually this piece is in a 4-4 four four with seconds. And you can actually, when you got used to this, you can feel, you can understand a rhythm when you see it notated. I don't say it's easy, and we have got a little break of eight seconds here, and uh, it's hard. To, and and at, at at the end, uh, at 28, we hear one more of these of these piano beeps, and which I'm supposed to play with, and you have to train to to get into this. And I have got the the, the score of what the birds sing underneath, so I so I can follow this. Uh, but since these uh, little snippets of birds are stop at some point and they have a very distinct uh, point where they start and where they end, I can hear a rhythm. Uh, so uh, with this piece, this is just uh, track six of about 23 different tracks and I had a MIDI pedal, a MIDI keyboard and I would press the, the, the buttons on the MIDI keyboard and play with them, in this case for 28 seconds, mostly only for five or, or four uh, seconds and then I would play uh, the next one. Um, and so I can, I can play freely and I, ca I cannot get lost because I play my own thing and when I get lost then I just press the next one and then we'll hear the tape coming in. This is not possible when you have a sound file like this. This is another piece that you're going to hear tonight. This is by Brian Kane. And his soundtrack sounds like this. here at some points they are louder things and it might be possible to really say this is here in this quintuplet on the third beat but we hear a constant going on of shoveling of mud and uh, we decided to do this uh, again with, with a click track because I said it, it's really hard to get a 4-4 out of what I'm listening now and uh, actually it's starting to play with it. So, just an example that with the birds it works because it's just a few information and it is um, and it is put the way that you sometimes really hear a one and a three and a, and a four but with just a recording of shoveling mud but the shoveling of mud comes just anywhere you wouldn't expect it or you would expect it it's just uh, too hard to play along.
Um, the last example for playing uh, with tape is, an, is a very easy one. That would mean that you have a technician, a sound technician, and he uh, plays the tape for you. And uh, I, will, I will not uh, play an example for this. Um, in this case, I would sit on the piano and uh, I, I can play as free as I want, and then I give the sound technician a nod, and he uh, would start the tape. This is, of course, just as inaccurate um, as, the, as, a, uh, as a stopwatch would be, because um, you never know if there's a latency when, when the tape stops. It can be, it can be quite uh, correct, um, but of course it would, it would be easier if I would just, just press it. Okay, uh, that is so much for tape and piano. Now let's go on to the last one, which includes live electronics. Live electronics is uh, different from playing along with tape uh, because the instrument like uh, the grand piano gets recorded with a microphone. The signal from the microphone gets through the wire into a computer and is transformed there and then in the computer in real time. Um, this is not possible for a long time, especially uh, now we have this. Uh, it's possible to do it on little laptop computers and we just take them with us. Um, I don't know exactly when was the first piece with the live electronics. Do you happen to know? Mid -90s. Mid 90s. Before that, you uh, just uh, the means to to compute the the, the di digital signal processing was just too uh, too hard. Um, so what you can do is all what you all the the, the